So may I extend a warm welcome to you all as we gather this afternoon to celebrate and give thanks for the life of Matthew Alexander Wheeler, or Matt as he was known, or indeed a host of other names that I'm sure we'll hear about in due course. Today we join in sharing deep sadness at his sudden death, but we also join in giving thanks for all that he was, for all that he gave and shared, for all that he did throughout his life, as we commend him to God, our loving creator, and as we pray for his eternal rest in God's love and peace. So let's stand as we sing our first hymn, Jerusalem. So would you please be seated for our first tribute. Hello. Emergency tequila. Writing this despite the enormous shock and sadness filled me with warm and wonderful memories when I think back on almost six decades of friendship. Paddy and I have known this funny, gentle, and loyal friend forever. Although he was infuriatingly good-looking, <laughs> surprisingly old-fashioned, he was also overwhelmingly generous and kind, with a side order of quiet stubbornness and glorious mishaps. You will hear plenty of fabulous stories later from Paddy and Jimmy about the chaos in cars and boats, the rugby tours, the ski trips, the love of a good wine, a strong ale, maybe the frustration of a badly stacked dishwasher, or the aversion to a fancy dress invitation. Whatever your memory, I'm certain it will bring great fondness and laughter. Matt was always a reluctant star of the show, but a church here full to the brim is a fabulous legacy. He will have a wry smile with this huge show of love for him and the whole family. To the family, 
Kathy, Maddie, Eliza, and Tom, to Jill, Nessa, Rob, and Jose, I would like to share an adaptation of a poem which to me is our dear old friend. It's called Safe Harbor. The storm has been prevailing for a while. Rain, thunder, and howling winds beating down on the ship, searching for a safe harbor. There have been so many times when the sun shone brightly in the clear, bright blue sky, looking up from the bow into forever. A gentle breeze, cotton candy clouds. But the weather sometimes moved in, a few scattered showers and thunderstorms, some downpours and flashes of lightning, with shelter hard to find. But the rainbow still shone with beacons of hope, vibrant against a backdrop of sea, a nod to the best of times. As the years passed by, the outlook changed, getting better and fading away, but they left their mark. Storms may have been forecast, but they wouldn't hiss, hit this ship, not again. No more damage would be done. The ship will be protected now. Tossed about no longer, gone from sight, but calm and safe in your harbor. Someone clever once wrote, you can make a new friend, but you can't just make an old friend. And whilst an old friend doesn't come with any conditions, it comes with responsibilities, and for us, it remains a lifelong honor and privilege to be godparents to Matt and Kathy's beautiful children. This has been an opportunity to share love and affection for an old friend, a rare moment to say what us chaps often don't say. It's a day for celebrating, with lots of laughter, but also remembering that it's always later than you think. To you, my friend, we miss you. I miss you. You're a special man and will always be a special friend. Keep trimming those sails, sipping the tequila. I love you forever. Crossing the Bar by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Sunset and evening star and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that, the dark. And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out are born of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Matthew Wheeler. Matt, tequila wheeler, wheels, or simply wheeler. <laughs> Kathy, family, friends. In the summer of 2003, I nervously turned up to Lehman to start a new job. I needn't have worried. I was introduced to Matt Wheeler. He looked me straight in the eye and with a surprisingly firm handshake, welcomed me to the team. By the end of the day, 
I knew I had landed on my feet. It felt like I had just met a new best friend. As the weeks rolled into months, my early impressions were proven right. Matt was a straight shooter. He meant what he said, and dictum may and pactum was to the fore. Many times you'd look at Matt, and on the surface, nothing much appeared to be going on. He was unflappable. Matt had the perfect demeanour and mannerisms of a jobber. He oozed guile, always keeping a straight face. Was he long, short, making money or a lot of money, or actually down half a bar? Talking of bars, early on, Wheels took me to his local watering hole, the Flying Horse. He ordered a pint of Two Star, and in the first couple of gulps, half the pint had simply disappeared. A smile was on his face, and the words, that's better, Jimbo, were uttered. This was the norm. Matt loved cricket, rugby, shooting, wine, and the occasional flutter on a horse. We always had plenty to talk about, but probably the biggest subject of all was talking about the market. Matt was exceedingly well-read, be it research or the FT. He was a perma-bear and believed things were for selling. Matt arrived in the city at Ackroyd and Smithers in 1985. He couldn't have chosen better. He became the head blue button. In the morning meeting soon after, he was laying the law down, telling one of his contemporaries to be quiet. It was clear what was to come. He wouldn't be messing around in business. In the years to follow, in the tradition of an Ackroyd education, you rotated around the back office and through the different pitches. During that rotation, he was working on the telecoms pitch when he took the opportunity to disappear for his morning constitutional. Five minutes later, he returned to find the senior management at his desk. Matt asked what was going on. He was told that in his absence, the boys had taken on a very large block trade in Vodafone. Unfortunately, as soon as the trade printed, the shares sold off leaving Matt sitting on an eye-watering mark-to-market loss. This quickly became known as the £5 million poo. <laughs> Matt stayed loyal to Ackroyd, which eventually became UBS, for 17 years. An incredible amount of time for a first job. This showed testament to the firm he worked for, and ultimately, their respect for him. Why was evident when I joined Lehman. When a sales trader asked Matt for a price, he would stand up, clearly telling anyone within 50 yards what they were, the price and the size. Matt didn't like or need the hoot and holler system. Sales traders don't want to let their clients down nor do they want arguments. They deal with someone they can trust, someone with the skills and the balls to make them and their clients look good. Matt was fastidious, and Matt was that man. Often, salesmen would appear on the pitch looking for colour as to why a stock was a feature that day. Matt didn't waste their time with the normal, more buyers and sellers flippant remark. He added value, often going on to provide ideas to pass back to their clients. Of course, it goes without saying that he was quite often talking his book. Matt, of course, also had his eccentricities. When the P&L opened lower and when conference calls had finished, 
The FT used to come out of the briefcase. No messing about. It was fully opened onto the floor between our chairs. Then the polish and brushes were aligned on the desk. <laughs> the shoes were off. The polish tin was opened and placed on the newspaper. The process began. The key was the conversation that went with it. Then the whole kit and caboodle was packed away, paper folded into the bin, and then there was a spin of the chair and a double star moment on the mouse whilst he checked the P&L. Believe me, sometimes it worked. One day a friend started to tell us this story about a friend of his who was buying up parcels of wine from distressed sellers. Wine and the term distressed seller in the same sentence really piqued Matt's interest. He loved value and could smell a bargain at a hundred feet. His friend had bought 40 cases of wine but was really struggling to sell 10 of them. What's the problem with the wine, Matt asked. Well, I was expecting some sort of story about left bank, right bank, the year, or even the chateau. But it turned out that the issue was that they were cases of half bottles. Matt immediately piped up, half bottles, half price. A call was made, and the next thing I knew, we had five cases of 94 Chateau Macayu each. A good trade was often shared by Matt. In the Lehman days, Matt and I used to regularly go to the Oval to watch England play cricket. They were lovely picnics with friendly two-way markets on runs per over or a particular batsman of interest. Unfortunately, the fun police got involved. Apparently, the cost of the ticket wasn't enough to satisfy the sponsor's bottom line. Rules came in about what could be brought into the ground. So the next season, we arrived at the Hobbs Gate. Both of our coolers were opened, and this particularly bored security guard lifted out two one-and-a-half-litre Evian bottles from a deluge of ice from Matt's cooler. Matt looked at me, a slightly worried look on his face, until the security guard spotted four cans of Tenants Extra lying below. The guard, somewhat gleefully, told Matt that they were confiscated and then signalled for us to pass through to take our seats. Pints of beer, trades and banter ensued. All was quickly forgotten. At lunch, sandwiches were handed out and to my horror, wheels reached for the Evian. Not a minute later, he looked at me, passing and raising a glass. Smiling, he said, God, I love my so, Jimbo. <laughs> Matt, to some, was a private and humble man. He didn't believe in small talk. He couldn't see the point. When talking, he was never 11 a reef. He was 10 at most. He didn't have a flash watch or designer-branded clothes, just a daily made-to-measure suit and multiple pairs of church's shoes. In his early days, Matt was a keen sailor. Well, the city, especially fund management, can be a lot like sailing. You need to be a chameleon, quickly adapting to changes. In the good times, you set as much sail on the masts as you can and sit back to enjoy the ride, running with the wind or the momentum of the market. When the wind changes, the positions or sails are trimmed, the tacking begins. Of course, when storms approach, it's risk off. You batten down the hatches and hope to ride it out. So when his days at Barcap came to a close, 
I jumped at the opportunity to work with Matt again. After all, I'd seen him roll up his sleeves to get the work done. I knew I could leave him to sail the ship if I wanted to go below deck. Throughout his city career, of course, there was only one captain, Cathy, the wife he adored. Later, of course, the children's stories came to the fore, all of whom he was immensely proud of. It was never said, you could just see it in his eyes. As you will no doubt expect, over the last six weeks, numerous old colleagues have called me up to talk about Matt. Stories have been exchanged, and whilst I want to share those stories with you today, there simply isn't time. Too many old jobbing stories. I've had to skip the ABI block trade, the white van man, the patient bear, his love of the French, not. <laughs> the grenadier, the wain Waitrose wine bar, his favourite, given the lack of mobile signal. But I do want to share some of the comments that talk to the man. Matt's specialist salesman. The time I spent with him made a very strong impression on me. They were some of the happiest times I've had in my career in finance. One of his blue buttons. Matt was something of a father figure to me. He will always be a hero of mine. A colleague at Barcat. Matt backed his friends and team, gave me confidence and never let me down. His constant show of support personified his calmness and great character, no matter what. Of course, there were many, many more, but to be honest, the same themes shine through. Matt was respected and loved by all that he worked with. He was a family man. He was genuine, honest. He had balls. He was a team player, a father figure, a man of principle. He loved a joke or a prank. He was always smart, clean-shaven, with polished shoes. He liked his pain sunny side up, always with a smile on his face. On occasion, he was a gritty man's man. To me, Matt was my right-hand man, my wingman. It brings tears to my eyes at how much I will miss him. Put simply, Matt was a jobber and a gentleman. God rest his soul. Thank you. So let's all stand as we sing that great hymn of the sea, Eternal Father.
So do please be seated. Remember Me by Anthony Dowson. Speak of me as you have always done. Remember the good times, laughter and fun. Share the happy memories we've made. Do not let them wither or fade. I'll be with you in the summer's sun and when the winter's chill has come. I'll be the voice that whispers in the breeze. I'm peaceful now, put your mind at ease. I've rested my eyes and gone to sleep. But memories we've shared are yours to keep. Sometimes our final days may be a test. But remember me when I was at my best. Although things may not be the same, don't be afraid to use my name. Let your sorrow last for just a while. Comfort each other and try to smile. I've lived a life filled with joy and fun. Live on now. Made me proud of what you'll become. Water tower. Tequila's in here. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Kathy, Maddie, Eliza, and Tom, Jill, Ness, Rob, and Jace, I would like to thank you all for the love and support that you have expressed over the last few months. The outpouring of love and happy memories that you've all shared for Matt has meant a huge amount to everyone. And from Mark and myself, a personal thank you for all the support we've received from family and friends alike. It's been so incredibly touching. <laughs> if you get bored, just start playing. <laughs> To see so many people gathered in this lovely church today is, uh, and for the many more actually who have joined us remotely, including some from as far afield as Antigua. Hi Jamie and Lucy. It is a testament to how much we love Matt and what a wonderful, generous, funny and thoughtful friend he was to us all. It's been a huge privilege to have known Matt for almost my entire life. And we've had a belly full of laughs all the way through. And I wish I could share every one of those moments with you today, but honestly, we would be here for days. They are, however, times that I will cherish forever. Mark and I both agreed that writing a tribute is a great challenge, especially for when it's for one of the very best mates who's left us far too soon. But Matt brought so much joy and laughter into my life that it's made my job today a little bit easier. I could write a book about my times spent in the company of this crazy guy. But for now, I'll just have to settle on a short eulogy, short reflection of the life of a very dear friend. Matt was born on the 9th of December 1966 in Crawley Hospital. His very proud mother said that he was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. I think we can agree with you on that one, Jill. <laughs> he spent his early years at Folly Cottage in Peaslake, where he was joined by Ness, before moving to Hurtwood House at the age of four, when Rob and finally Jose completed the sibling lineup. Wills first came into my life when we met at Shear Nursery at the tender age of three, I believe. 
He was doing the ironing. <laughs> he loved his little ironing board, and I'm told he was very fastidious about it too. I'm sure that laid the foundations for the attention to detail and orderliness that became his hallmark in later life. A few weeks later, I introduced Matt to Mark, and the three of us formed a very strong and lifelong friendship, which took us on a roller coaster ride of laughs, adventures, mishaps, and giggles. I couldn't have asked for two finer friends to go through life with. From sheer nursery, Matt and I followed each other to Peaslake Primary School, where our friendship blossomed. And then, age seven, we descended on Woolpit Prep School, now called Duke of Kent, where we honed our skills at being very naughty little schoolboys. I remember quite vivid, vividly one morning, just before a history lesson, how Matt violently shook the teacher's stationery cupboard so hard that when he went to open it, the contents just spilled out all over the floor. And Matt spent the rest of the lesson facing the corner, <laughs> giggling away to himself. We both enjoyed a wonderful sense of freedom at Woolpit, doing no work, playing in the woods, climbing trees, building camps and having battles against other camps. We were positively encouraged to, uh, to, to be outside and explore everything that Mother Nature had to offer. In fact, Matt took his outdoor interests a step too far one day when he was tempted to eat some lovely red and white spotted agaric mushrooms that he'd stumbled across in the woods. Mild panic and stomach pump later, he was right as rain and back to his old self again. We went our separate ways after Woolpit as Matt moved on to Cranwell School in East Horsley and then on to Blundells down in Tiverton, Devon, where he absolutely thrived, immersing himself in the many outdoor pursuits that the school had to offer, including the Ten Tours expedition, which he absolutely loved. He was also introduced to rugby for the very first time, but unfortunately he badly damaged his knee in the very first term and had to wear a full leg plaster for many weeks afterwards. Matt's mischievous side was never far away while he was at Blundell's though, which would sometimes land him in trouble. One night, along with a bunch of mates, he carried a bed and its sleeping occupant out of his dormitory and plonked it in the middle of the playing fields, <laughs> citing noisy snoring as his excuse to his rather surprised housemaster. Matt did extremely well at Blundell's and he left with a respectable quota of O-levels. He and I came together again at Godalming Sick Form College where we hooked up with a bunch of other reprobates who also became lifelong friends. Aside from being annoyingly handsome and always immaculately addressed in his cords, his brogues, his barber jacket, with his red and white spotted neckerchief and occasionally smoking a pipe, <laughs> Matt's other main attribute was he had access to his mother's brown Land Rover County and he was always happy to drive everyone all over the place, to the pub, to Point to Points, down to Cornwall for a riotous holiday, and to an endless stream of 18th birthday parties. He even took it on a detour through Eric Clapton's house once, having lost control, driving far too quickly down a bumpy track that led past his house. The great man himself wasn't at home at the time, but he took it well enough, and apart from accepting a bit of humble pie from Matt, he generously let him off the hook, more or less. It was always an adventure when out in the car with Matt in those days, and we had some pretty hairy moments, to say the least. Playing chicken at a level crossing with an oncoming train was possibly one of our more stupid games, I must admit. But on a tamer note, we occasionally took our respective Land Rovers off-roading from the Willie IV pub, where we used to live, over to the villagers in Blackheath, which is always quite a challenge. One night, we flooded the engine of my dad's Land Rover by charging far too quickly through a massive puddle. It was pitch dark in the middle of the woods somewhere near Blackheath, so we abandoned the car and had to have an incredibly long walk home, returning the next day to get the car started again once the engine had dried out. I don't think my dad ever knew about that one, until today, that is. Sorry, Dad. Unfortunately, Matt did have a few car pranks over the years, most notably, I suppose, writing off his lovely Primrose MGB Roadster while driving up the A3, or his infamous game of cat and mouse with the police 
after he had rolled his mother's Morris eye towel in the snow up Hound House Lane. We even managed to crash into each other once, but again, the less said about that, the better, I think. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> they were fairly carefree days back then, and I look back on them with great fondness. We would spend almost every weekend flitting between the rugby club and the pub, and the golf course and the pub, or friends' houses and the pub, where we would chew the cud with each other and other mates, and just generally embracing life. Matt's A-levels weren't quite as impressive as his O-levels, so he took himself up to London to start a new life working in the Stock Exchange, which Jimmy has described to us so wonderfully. Despite trying to explain his job to me many, many times over the years, I never did understand what Matt did, but he was obviously very good at it, and he met a lot of new friends from the London set along the way, and of course, including Cathy. Matt initially moved in with his father in the Golders Green, Islington area, before buying his own place in Shad Thames near Tower Bridge. Cathy eventually persuaded him out of his bachelor pad into her flat in Chiswick briefly, I think, before buying their first home in Richmond. They were married on the 8th of July 2000, and in June 2001, Maddie was born. The family then made the big move to the Cedars here in Crondall in August 2002, and in September 2003, Eliza came into this world, with Tom completing the lineup in May 2005. They lived at the Cedars until June 21, before finally moving into their current home in Farnham. As Jimmy says, Matt was a very proud and loving father, and he did dedicated as much of his time as he could to his children. Family life took over, as it did for all of us then, and sadly, we didn't get to see each other as much as we would have liked. But we still found time for an appalling round of golf, the annual lad's ski trip, and dinner parties here and there, and we would always pick up where we left off, as great friends do. I just wish I could have had more time with him in later years, because he really was such wonderful company. Wills loved his sport, and he was particularly fond of shooting, rugby, golf, cricket, and sailing. He was a very accomplished rugby player, and he formed a pivotal role wearing number two shirt with such distinction at Cranley Rugby Club. During our heady days in London League, or Surrey League Division One, I should say, before he helped us gain promotion to London SW3 Division. He managed to get through his rugby career relatively unscathed, other than, some, other than some broken ribs and a punctured lung, which is pretty remarkable considering how much he put his body on the line every time he played. Matt also played pretty hard off the pitch too. He toured three times with the club, and on our trip to Frankfurt in the 1980s, one night, he reduced the room to tears. A group of us were sitting around the table drinking far too much snaps and bigging up our own personal achievements in life. When Matt suddenly announced, I managed to get a balloon stuck up my nose once. <laughs> Never has a line been so perfectly delivered. He was also instrumental in helping me steal an enormous hotel sign, which we somehow managed to smuggle onto the plane home, and it hung proudly in the clubhouse until many years later, it burned down. And then it was lost forever. Personally, though, I don't think Matt ever got the recognition he deserved as a rugby player, but those who played alongside him at Cranley, we've got some here today, they will know how much of a contribution he made to the club on and off the field. On the water, I think it's fair to say that Matt had quite a few moments during his sailing days, but he was never happier than when out in his mirror dinghy, Sinbad, during junior fortnight at Itchener Sailing Club in our early teens. He then moved up to the 26-foot fixed keel Solent Sunbeam class, initially crewing for Lou and Graham on Sugar Daddy before buying a share of Romany with Mark and Jamie Telfer. On board, Matt did everything to the max, and always to the excess. He took my brother JD for his first sail in Sinbad once at Itchener, setting off from the jetty at breakneck speed, with a large audience cheering him on. Unfortunately, he slammed straight into the side of the club captain's boat, <laughs> causing rather a large hole in the side. You forgot to put the rudder down, wheels! We all shouted after him. 
We teamed up as helm and crew for a couple of summers during Itch and a Fortnight, which was basically a two-week knees up with a bit of sailing in between. During one of our races, we were in our usual position at the back of the fleet, enjoying the sun with a beer or two, when Matt suddenly burst out, come on, danger field, time to catch these buggers up. At which point he pulled the sails right in, the boat keeled over, and he promptly fell overboard. <laughs> you forgot to use the toe straps wheels. I yelled as I disappeared into the distance in an out of control dinghy amid hoots of laughter. Lunch at the clubhouse in those days was often quite challenging. Matt had a penchant for crusty bread smeared with a massive dollop of balsam cheese, washed down with a pint or three of ale. He wore railway tracks in his teeth at the time in those days, and that always led to a bit of a stomach-churning experience whenever he smiled, <laughs> which was often. Matt took the step up from dinghies to the fixed kill Solent Sunbeam boats in his stride, sailing with Graham and Lou from 1990 to 93, and then Romney with Mark and Jamie from 94 to 98. Shortly after they bought Romney, Matt took Mark and his then girlfriend, SJ, out to demonstrate how a sunbeam really should be sailed. Unfortunately, they got stuck on a mud bank on a dropping tide. They had to drop anchor, abandon the boat, and then spend about an hour wading to shore through knee-deep, freezing cold, stinking itch in the mud, only to endure a lot of mockery once they got back to the clubhouse. They then had to do it all in reverse again many hours later to retrieve the boat once it was afloat again. I'm not sure SJ ever sailed again after that. No, she shakes her head. <laughs> the highlight of the sailing calendar was Cow's Week and the uh, Isle of Wight, which was more of an adult version of Itch and a Fortnight, only with more drinking and less sailing from what I recall. There was an endless stream of parties taking place in the enormous marquees on the waterfront where we always seemed to gravitate towards. Lou told me a story recently, which I, I must pass on. It was during one of their earlier Cow's Week campaigns and Matt was crewing for them on Sugar Daddy. They were all bunked up in a small flat opposite the squadron at the time. Matt had gone out clubbing with his brother Rob and Jose. You probably don't remember this, do you? No, you won't because they absolutely got battered and returned home in the early hours of the evening. For some reason, Matt ended up sleeping on the bathroom floor with Rob. And when, Rome, when Lou woke them up in the morning, Matt had a banana skin stuck to the side of his face. <laughs> After a reviving breakfast, duly suited and booted, they caught the launch from the marina out to where the sunbeams were moored. Matt had the usual case of beer on his lap, and he found himself sitting next to the Honourable Francis Fillimore, a very highly respected and long-serving member of the sunbeam fleet. Once on board Sugar Daddy, they faffed around getting the boat ready for the race before Lou finally confessed to Matt that he still had the banana skin stuck to his face. <laughs> Matt was mortified. I can't believe you made me sit next to an honourable with a banana skin stuck to my face. But when it came down to the serious business, Matt was an excellent sailor, and in a race situation, he was extremely good at timing the start. He often put us right at the front of the pack, uh, over the starting line, which really made for exciting sailing. Uh, and then we'd slowly retreat down the order, uh, but at least we always got the pulse racing at the starts. On the slopes, Matt had a very unique skiing style. Bolt upright, skis permanently glued together, the barest number of turns to get from A to B. He would frequently stop on the other side of the piste from us, which never, we, we never really could fathom. Uh, he was also very distinguishable in his dark blue jacket and bright yellow trousers. So we could always spot him disappearing off in the distance as he went down the wrong run in the world of his own. Cue mild panic and yells of, Wheeler! But he always seemed so completely unfazed by it all. I could never understand what all the fuss was about. There was always the odd mishap along the way, of course. Whenever Matt went off piste, intentionally or otherwise, we always knew where he was because of the colourful language that followed him down the slope. He got so cross with conditions in Val d'Isere one day that he ended up throwing his skis down the slope. It wasn't often that Matt lost his temper, but it well and truly erupted then, which we all found highly amusing. 
I laid the blame firmly at Mark's feet to that one because he was leading the way and it was absolute carnage, but it was also incredibly funny. Matt was, of course, a legend of the lunch table, and we would always take it upon ourselves, he would always take it upon himself to order the most expensive wine or the hottest pizza or the biggest round of something nasty that he could lay his hands on. Our lad's holiday in Val last year had Matt on his very best form. We had a very, very strong lunch in a restaurant halfway down the notoriously treacherous black run called The Fass. And at the end of the meal, we were handed an enormous vat of Genepi on the house, which was a mistake. Wheels took charge. Needless to say, we finished the Genepi to a round of applause from the staff and then had a very wobbly ski down to the bottom of the slope. That was a very special moment for Mark and I, and this is the map we'll always remember, mate. There are far too many tales of other adventures to mention today, but Matt was always there leading the charge. You could tell by the glint in his eye and his cheeky grin when trouble was afoot. But you just couldn't help yourself, Wills, could you, mate? So that's my short tribute to you, Wills, and I really wish you were standing next to me now to hear these words. We've shared so many laughs and happy times together over the years, but now you are gone, and I'm struggling to compute that we won't play a rubbish game of golf again, or have a beer, or laugh out loud together again. But each time I think of you, mate, or see your photo, it brings a smile to my face, because that's what you did for us all, Matt. You made us laugh, and you made us smile. So keep trimming those sails, my dear, crazy friend and thank you for coming into my life it's been some journey so let's stand as we sing our next hymn
So please be seated. The reading is taken from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I'm the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So today we've come together to commemorate Matt's full and active life among us. And what a life that has been. All those stories have only just started. A life that had such a huge positive influence on so many, as your presence here is just the start of a testament. Today is a day to remember him with fondness, as stories and memories are exchanged as tears and smiles are shared. And today is a time to reflect on the journey of life that we are all embarked on, as we support one another traveling through the unexpected waters in which we currently find ourselves. These are challenging times. But as Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Because through his life, death, and resurrection to new life on that first Easter day, Jesus showed us that we are all loved by our powerful, loving creator, who really does understand what life on earth is like, and promises to love us through life and through death, as we move to that new way of being in God's spiritual heaven. Because God really does love and cherish us, and really is there for us when our time comes and we cross the bar. So today, I encourage you to be reassured by the fact that Christians have always believed that there is real hope in death as in life because of the personal relationship that we are invited to have with that creative energy we call God. That God created each one of us for eternal life with him in a form we can't understand this side of death. Because that's what Jesus' life and death revealed to us. That's why he rose on that first Easter morning. The Easter promise we celebrated again just a few weeks ago is a promise of a new existence with God for all who have died. A promise made to Matt and to every one of us. And God promises to help strengthen and guide us on the way ahead if we just open our hearts to his presence around us. And he offers us his eternal peace that passes all understanding. So let's keep remembering Matt through what we do and say. Let's not allow our hearts to be troubled. Let's put our trust firmly in our creator God because God is loving Our God is faithful and now holds Matt in his eternal love and rest. So I pray that God will give you his comfort, his strength and his peace today and in all the days to come. Amen. 
So let's hold all that we've heard as we come to our time of prayer and reflection together. Father God, hear our prayers and comfort us today. Reassure us of your love and presence with us all through our lives and through our deaths. Renew our trust in your son, Jesus, who showed us the way to eternal life. Strengthen our faith that Matt and all who have died, surrounded by your love, will share in your new life in heaven, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Father God, we thank you because you made us in your image and gave us so many gifts in mind, body and spirit to share with those around us through our lives. Today we thank you for Matt, for all that he was, for all that he did, for all that he shared, for all the memories made. Lead us through the sadness we feel at losing him and make us more aware that you are the one from whom every perfect gift comes, including that precious gift of eternal life with you once our journey through this life has come to an end. Guide and strengthen us for the way ahead, we pray. Amen. And we pray for all who grieve today, for all Matt's family and friends. Heavenly Father, give to all who are bereaved the spirit of faith and courage, that they may meet the days to come with steadfastness and with patience. Help us to really trust in your love for all your creation through our lives and through our deaths to eternal life with you. This we ask in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we join our cares together in those words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So would you please stand? So let us commend Matt to the love and care of God, our maker and redeemer. Heavenly Father, by your mighty power, you gave us life, and in your love have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust Matt to your keeping in the faith of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who himself died and rose again to save us, and is now alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. May Matt rest in your eternal peace today and through eternity. Amen. So before we come to our final hymn, may I remind you that you are all warmly invited to share refreshments in the village hall just down the straight path there following this service. If you are unable to stay, please do linger at the back. Right at the back right-hand side of the church, there is the condolence book. So if you're not going down to the village hall, please write in it now at the end of the service. But if you are going to the village hall, the book will follow you and there will be plenty of opportunity to write in it there. Thank you. And if you'd like to make a donation in Matt's memory, there will be a retiring collection to benefit the RNLI, a cause which Matt supported throughout his life. Donations can be made following the link on the order of service as well, and there are little cards around the church if you'd like to take one to do it at home later. Thank you. And so we join in singing that great hymn of Christian promise, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer.
May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. guys what a sing hey <laughs> yeah. what tributes those guys were amazing well, they've always been in our lives. yeah 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 it is and i'll always forget how you guys you know that Just... well done though Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's the boys, the rugby club. Which is what that guy's in. There's a lot of all that reference as well. Oh, we 